the topic today is terrorism in the media. And your, your sponsor's first idea was to get a well-known terrorist to come and talk to you. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're all busy today, and uh, we therefore had to come to somebody from the media. Uh, although, as you heard, I served as a lawyer and practiced before, for seven and a half years before turning to a life of crime and becoming a magazine publisher. <coughs> uh, Despite which fact, perhaps the cause of the legal background, I have to confess that um, I, um, I have made something of a cottage industry out of being critical of the media. I, I think that there are some things they do that are not all that admirable. But on this particular topic, how they should handle terrorism, I confess to being torn. And when Cliff asked me if I could speak on that subject, I said, Cliff, I'm not absolutely sure that I have a firm line on it. There seems to me it could be argued a couple of ways. He said, well, maybe that's why you're just the one to make the speech then. So you may be hearing a little bit of other handedness about this, although in the long run I'm going to have a, a specific recommendation. First, <clears throat> a couple of general observations. I think that terror, of course, in a sense, terrorism, if by that you mean individual acts of violence motivated by politics of some sort, has been around for a long, long time, all of human history, I guess. But it does seem to me that in recent years, more than usually in, in human history, terrorism has become an institutional fact of life. And we better make up our minds that it's here to stay. There are several reasons for this. Um, technological reasons are part of it. Uh, we can get around the world quicker these days in jet planes from here to there. Uh, we can communicate faster. The bad guys as well as the good guys have walkie-talkies and, uh, and can use radio communications to detonate bombs from a distance and things of that sort. Um, the bombs themselves are getting uh, more deadly and easier to hide. Um, <clears throat> then, too, we all know more about each other. I suppose that uh, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, the, the citizens of Iran or Libya did not spend as much time brooding over the United States or even Britain, which would have been the superpower of that day, as they do now. But now they see us on television and they know all about pornography and AIDS and we're the great Satan. And their, their jealousy of the, of the impoverished, in most cases relatively impoverished lives that they lead, that they lead and of our strength uh, overpowers them and uh, combined with their differences of religion and so on makes us a natural target. And then you get that youthful idealism that is, can always, is always there and always good except when it is perverted as it can be. We get now young people in the Middle East without much prospects of their own who think, well, gosh, uh, I can certainly make one big splashy statement against the great Satan if I, if I lose my life in the process with uh, a bomb or a car bomb or something of that sort. In that sense, uh, terrorism is what they used to call the pistol. It's an equalizer. One guy may be big and the other guy may be small, but if the small guy has the pistol, he has canceled out the difference in size and then some. And similarly, uh, a lot of small individuals can or think they can in some way uh, effectively retaliate for imagined wrongs against the United States by means of this equalizing process of terrorism. We could stay on just an analysis of the motives and mechanics of terrorism for the rest of my time, but I want to get next to the media. What precisely is, should be, the role of the media in respect to terrorism? I don't think there's any doubt what the media believe it should be. The media will tell you and will believe that their job is to report the news. That's what it is. And they have been commissioned, if not by God, at any rate by some other high authority, to go out and just get the facts, ma'am, and report them to us. What we do with them is our business, but they must not be 
uh, intruded upon in their high mission of getting and reporting the facts. They will admit, if you press them a little more closely, that uh, this gives them a kind of an appetite for flashy facts. Uh, good news usually isn't all that much worth a headline. Uh, uh, a third quarter of economic progress, bleh, who cares? But one really good sharp downturn or the drop in the market that one would assume would be coming after the long run-up will get all over the papers because we all like to read about that kind of splashy bad news. And um, uh, similarly, uh, uh, without meaning in this case any criticism at all, it is true that a thing like the Challenger tragedy, which occurred right there on live television with that brilliant white smoky explosion is, is in a sense news of the first order. Nobody could minimize its importance or blame the press for covering it. And yet, let's just take two examples recently that, that show the trouble that you get into and some of the problems that this can create. A year ago, June, not less than a year ago, June of last year, TWA 847 was on the ground in Beirut. All the passengers had been taken off except one American who was killed right there on board and is being held by uh, terrorists. And the terrorists start holding a press conference. There they are, with sacks over their heads, but nonetheless, there to tell you what they want and what they demand and what they object to. And we sit dutifully and listen as our media cover this uh, because we don't, or, or in the first instance, don't think we have really any choice in the matter. And then, by gosh, the, the prisoners themselves, the hostages, are marched on. And there they are in front of us, and uh, their spokesman is heard to say, well, you know, we begin to think that there may be something to the side that these people have. They have been treated unjustly. And you don't know what kind of pressures he's under or what kind of Stockholm syndrome is overtaking him that he begins to sympathize with his captors. But again, the whole darn show is in their hands and all the television networks of the earth are covering it live in color in prime time. <clears throat> that was example one. Example two, a little less dramatic. The British Broadcasting Corporation managed to arrange an interview with a man who we may assume, I think there's not much argument about it, uh, represented and was a spokesman for the Irish Republican Army's terrorist wing, military wing. And uh, he was going to sit up there and tell them what he thought was wrong with the policy of the British government and uh, why they were doing what they were doing and why violence was justified and so on. And uh, you may recall, this was about a, in the middle of last year, I think Margaret Thatcher or somebody else in, in her cabinet brought sufficient pressure on the BBC not to give this man the matchless forum that he wanted. Whereupon all hell broke loose in the media because they wanted to know who was interfering with them interviewing a man who was a news story, no doubt about that. And uh, the government uh, lost quite a little bit of skin off its nose in the process of extricating itself there. They hadn't realized it might be looked at that way. I think there is uh, a, 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 a Say, a legitimate difference of basic opinion between the media on the one hand and what might be generally called the law enforcement authorities on the other in the area of how do we cover terrorist activities. Uh, there's no question at all about the fact that the coverage plays into the terrorists' hands. They want to stress demands, or they want to blackmail us into releasing colleagues of theirs already in prison for terrorist acts, 
or they want to take vengeance for something that's been done that they didn't like, maybe with justice didn't like. And uh, so they have gone to the extent of inflicting harm or even death on innocent civilians who, whose only crime, if it was a crime, was like Robert Steatham in Beirut to have been a member of the United States Navy, or like the uh, uh, four who died in the uh, TWA bombing outside of Athens uh, recently, that they were just American citizens at a time when uh, somebody in the Arab world didn't like American citizens because of our attacks on Libya or something of that sort. On the other side is this media desire, which mounts, in their opinion, to an obligation to cover news. And if it's bad, well, they cannot be blamed for that, uh, so they would say. They have to cover it whether it's bad or not. Certainly, if it is bad. Collision. What do we do? What earthly rule can you devise? I'm not sure I have a very satisfactory solution to the dilemma, but I have a, a sort of a, at least a partial proposal. And I want to approach it by means of analogy because I think it is by means of analogy that we get to understand what is going on here. Let us imagine something somewhat different from a terrorist attack. And while this is a, in a sense, a diversion from the main thread of our discourse, you will see its connection, and it is, I think, intrinsically interesting and worthwhile to consider. I want to offer you a hypothesis. I don't think this is an implausible hypothesis at all. I think that it will happen, as a matter of fact. It's only a question of when. Let's suppose that somewhere up the road, a matter of months or a few years from now, the United States gets into a brush war of some sort, either in Central America or in the Middle East or maybe elsewhere. In any case, not World War III. I'm talking about a limited war for limited objectives against probably some smaller nation or series of nations in pursuance of American policy and, and justified objectives of ours, let's, let's imagine. Or at least so the government believes. Let us assume that another faction in our country bitterly opposes this, we, just as we did in the case of Vietnam. You had some people on one side, some on the other, just as you would if uh, we, we were to send troops to Nicaragua, some on one side, some on the other, and so on. You might get the same effect or might not in the Middle East. In any case, let us assume, just for the sake of my hypothesis, that what would generally be called liberal opinion is bitterly opposed to this military action. And that the media, which are certainly dominated by uh, liberal opinion now, are still, at the time I'm talking about in the future, in my hypothesis, still dominant in the media. The TV crews come ashore, wherever it is, with the American forces, and start to film the war. Now here we enter into ground that is, if not entirely new, somewhat new. It, it didn't used to be, as late as World War II or even Korea, as easy, or even Vietnam, quite as easy, uh, to photograph a war as it has gotten to be since. But it is now possible to, with the technological equipment that TV has got, uh, to get right into it, to photograph the very ugly aspects that war has in a way that they didn't before. There will be American blunders. You remember we're supposed to have uh, bombed the mental hospital in Grenada. I don't know whether we did, but that was the allegation. OK, photograph of the mental hospital. Television interviews with the surviving patients and nurses about this American blunder. And uh, there are going to be American dead and wounded live color shots of the wounded being brought into the forward hospital. Live shots, it may be, of the dead.
switch to uh, Rochester, New York, where the mother of one of those boys has been found. And she sits there twisting her handkerchief and breaks down and cries right there on television. You've seen it already. You will see a lot more of it if this type of situation develops. Switch to Toronto, where the Canadian broadcasting system has obtained an interview with the foreign minister of the enemy country. And he's a very reasonable man, or that's the way he sounds. He explains why he opposes us. He appeals to the American people not to go along with this madness against his innocent country. Well, you can see where I'm, I'm leading. We will face, I don't say would in some hypothetical case, we will face in your time and my time, I suspect, unless we're very lucky, an all out, groin and eyeball effort by the American media to bring an American military venture to a dead halt because they don't like it. We are some distance from simply covering the news, are we not, at this stage of the game. You know as well as I do that the news you cover is the news you select to cover. Selection is the whole process. And I really don't know whether any democracy like ours can stand or could be expected to stand. The kind of sustained barrage right in our homes, in the living rooms, that American television is now capable of mounting if it doesn't like something. No country's ever had to do it before. No country has ever tried. Most countries have simply forbidden bad news in wars. We, in, in, in our wars, have, have avoided that kind of thing, but we have had, of course, censorship for military security, which is a slightly different question. Does it matter in such a case whether the war is a declared war? That, you notice, was not the case, technically, I think, in uh, Korea even, because that was a police action under United Nations auspices in legal theory. Certainly it was not the case in Vietnam. The war was never, Congress was never asked to declare it, although they were asked to finance it, and they certainly did. Uh, does it matter in terms of how the media should behave if in one case a military operation is part of a, an officially declared American war, and in the other case is just an executive throwing his weight around? I kind of think it might make a difference, because if we have had that congressional declaration of war, or of whatever the military situation is, short of, as I say, World War III, then there has been some kind of a political consensus reached that the government shall go forward and do this thing. You've got a sort of an official basis for it. Uh, it not, that doesn't mean that everybody will suddenly fall to and approve it, but you do have at least the argument, look, Buster, before you do what you propose to do, remember that this country has committed itself officially by a vote of Congress to this particular course of action. If you don't do that, it seems to me that the legitimacy of the operation is always open to some challenge, as was indeed the Vietnam War. And uh, I think the greatest mistake that Lyndon Johnson ever made, by the way, was in not getting, when he easily could have in the beginning, congressional authorization, not necessarily a declaration of war. I don't want to pin it to that. There, there are countries that would be ridiculous to declare war against when you want to conduct some kind of military operation. But to get an explicit congressional authorization, he did try that, as you know, with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Uh, and to some degree, maybe that covered him, but it should have been done at the beginning instead of trying to smuggle the war into the American society and win it on the cheap. So that I think that when we, in the future, embark on operations, as painful as it may be, it is going to be important to get that consent first or not embark. 
because after that we can confront a little bit differently the question of how the media should cover the news. I don't say it will be easy even then, but it does seem to me that direct attacks on American home front morale by means of careful, invidious selection of what you cover could be ruled out on the grounds that it is ridiculous to ask us under the rubric of news simply to sit there and take that kind of guff. We would still want to know the bad news, but we don't have to have what George Will brilliantly called the pornography of grief on our television screens watching mothers break down because it's theater. Now, this brings us back, I think, to the only suggestion that I have been able to generate in regard to terrorism. I think we do not yet, we have not yet, maybe that's a little too pessimistic, I say we are in the process only of making up our minds that terrorism is a form of war. Miniature war, limited war, but war nonetheless. The fact that uh, some uh, individual does it and that he doesn't profess to be acting in the name of a sovereign state or isn't wearing the uniform of one doesn't make it less war. It is simply war carried on by a different uh, means given the technology and the dimensions of the stage and the relative size of the players. It has been up until very, very recently absolutely cost-free for the terrorists who were doing it and I will come to that last, what may be going on in the Mediterranean now. But I suggest to you that if we can devise some mechanism by which, and again, I would go back to Congress and require that Congress recognize that international terrorism has become a threat to the security of the United States of America and that accordingly this government declares that it will take henceforth all military measures necessary to bring it so far as possible to an end. You don't have to call it a declaration of war, and to a certain extent those it is aimed at can define themselves. If some country wants to drop supporting that kind of thing, okay, we don't have to deduct them from the list because there is no list. They just are no longer among the people that we are after. But if you could in some way get Congress officially to recognize that this is a war situation, then I think we have the ground, or as much ground as we're ever going to get, to ask the media, or if need be, tell the media, that what they do in the coverage hereafter of terrorism is going to have to be measured against the best interests of the United States in the ongoing war. It would therefore be up to the government of the United States and not to ABC, NBC, and CBS whether they would agree reverently to interview uh, on television the terrorists in Beirut. We might decide to do it anyway. I, I, I could imagine that uh, uh, there, there could be various reasons why it might be best to let them be heard or let them be seen doing their dirty work. But in any case, the decision would no longer be, is this good prime time stuff for tonight's TV show? The decision would be, is this in the best interests of the United States and the people of the world who are fighting against terrorism? And that decision would be determinative. The people who, in our government, had the obligation to try to defend us against this sort of thing would be the ones that we would leave that to. I think we would be in a position, certainly, to, uh, if we wanted to, rule out uh, coverage by American sources, certainly, uh, or indeed broadcast in the United States from foreign sources, if we chose, as we would in wartime, a big war, um, uh, to exclude 
enemy propaganda. If we got into a war with the Soviet Union, am I behind the times to hope that we would not hear Vladimir Posner every morning on the Today Show telling us what he thought about it? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that's when the cameras would go off, as far as Mr. Posner is concerned. In fact, I think they should go off sooner than that, but that's another speech. Uh, in other words, I don't think we can ask the American people, or should ask them, to endure the unendurable. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with the old Roman dictum that solus populi suprema lex, the safety of the people, is the supreme law. And I think it is supreme even over what the press calls the people's right to know. Because as Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, you have forgotten the people's right not to know in certain cases. Now, as I say, I'm, I have something less than total confidence that we've solved here the problem of the conflicting demands of covering terrorism and, and at the same time combating it. But I think that out there somewhere in the definition of this as an act of war, and the understanding that that is exactly what it is and that is the way it must be responded to, out there is the best solution we can find to uh, the question of to what extent it ought to be covered as new. With regard to what is going on now, I'll devote a few minutes, maybe eight or nine, to this, and then I invite your comments and your criticisms and your questions, too. With regard to what is going on now, of course, nobody has taken me aside and whispered the simple truth in my ear. I watch as you do what is going on. To some extent, I have my sources in the administration, and they make this or that comment to me. But this is mostly analysis, not, not secret inside stuff. It seems to me that President Reagan has thought very carefully about this business of terrorism, and he hasn't been in any big hurry that, to rush forward and make a mistake. He was, as you know, has been criticized rather extensively for letting certain things go unpunished. Uh, I'm not so sure he has let them go unpunished. Um, There was, let's see, it was now two years ago in March, two years ago last month, a group, about a dozen Libyan dissidents, and I guess they were Libyan dissidents, uh, suddenly appeared at Colonel Gaddafi's military headquarters in Tripoli and got within 40 or 50 feet of him before they were all gunned down. I don't know who was behind it, but I don't necessarily assume it was Margaret Thatcher or Prime Minister Botha. Um, some things don't always work the way they should. Um, it is also true, and had been told me before he mentioned it in his press conference before last, that American intelligence has penetrated and stopped, thwarted, 120, actually the figure I heard was 126 separate terrorist uh, intended attacks. Those are the 126 pieces of good news you don't get over and against the one bad one that you do. And it's extremely hard to get intelligence on these uh, operations and these organizations because they have a very good test. If somebody comes up and says, I want to join your group, they say, good, go out and kill an American and come back and see us. Makes it kind of hard to get your CIA man into the group. Nonetheless, they have managed to get a good deal of information and stop at least 120 of these attacks. Uh, but he hasn't stopped them all, and uh, stopping all of them may be totally impossible. I think Mr. Reagan knows now exactly how he intends to proceed and is proceeding. He has found a way to keep it from being cost-free. Now, when there is a terrorist outrage, in the first instance, he called it a naval exercise, and it was definable as that. But when the Libyans objected, they lost two of their ships and a couple of their uh, air, ground to air missile sites in a rather surgical uh, strike or 
series of strikes, which was, you will notice, highly proportionate. He could just as easily have bombed Tripoli and killed hundreds of thousands of people. He didn't right after certain military objectives and was lucky enough not to lose a single American life in the process. That may not always be the case. He then withdrew his carriers and Colonel Gaddafi wasn't having any of this nonsense, so the next thing you know, he got the bomb on TWA 840 and then what happened in West Berlin and uh, uh, the most important thing is the latter because apparently the intelligence, this has been allowed, I think, to seep out. Uh, intelligence was able to actually obtain and decode the messages from Tripoli to East Berlin ordering that attack. So we have a pretty clear line to Colonel Gaddafi. And the American carriers have left Malaga and Italy and disappeared into the Mediterranean. And I suspect that there's going to be another proportionate surgical strike, this time maybe a little more painful. Now what's going to happen as a result of this? Colonel Gaddafi isn't going to stop right away. We'll probably get some more, although he will terrorize us at any point as much as he can. We couldn't certainly, by not doing this, prevent him from supporting terrorism. That we know. But surely up the line here, the military in Libya, for one thing, are going to start thinking, gee, we're losing an awful lot of small ships and, and ground-to-air missile sites here. Uh, is this so wise? And what may come next? And the people of Libya itself may start thinking, you know, that last one was an attack on a military dump on the edge of town, but the next one could be right smack in the town. Do we need this? And the rest of the Arab world is going to start seeing, it doesn't take a genius or a pro-American to see, that uh, Gaddafi is getting to be an awfully costly bauble for the Arab world to put up with. I have a feeling that if we will just persist the proportionate response to the terrorist outrages as they occur, linking them when you can to Libya, that up the line somewhere, things are going to get awful hot for Gaddafi and that he may be forced out or killed by his own people or other Arabs. And if that happens, it won't stop terrorism completely, but a message will go out to all the other countries of the Middle East. Look, look at what happened. It turned out not to be the way to go, gentlemen. It wasn't as cost-free as we thought it was. I think that some such progression is what President Reagan has in mind. He feels, and I think absolutely rightly, that as long as you make it totally cost-free for terrorism to continue, you're going to keep on getting more of it. It's, it's almost as simple as Jack Kemp's remark that if you tax something, you get less of it, and if you subsidize it, you get more of it. We may not be subsidizing terrorism, but we sure as heck haven't been taxing it. And uh, now we're going to start taxing it, penalizing it. And I suspect we're going to get less of it. That, at any rate, is, is his solution. And once again, it is not directly relevant to the question of media coverage. With regard to that, my suggestion, to reiterate it one last time, is let us understand that what we are engaged in here is a new form of war and that we cannot afford to treat these episodes as simply isolated cases of a man biting a dog and therefore being news. They are parts of a unit of a whole of a totality that amounts to war, and a war that must be won. Thank you very much.